Shalom, brothers and sisters. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from Yahuwah the Father and Yahushua the Messiah, his son. This is Brother David coming to you to bring you the laws, the statutes, the judgments and commandments of Yahuwah. And we're starting our lesson from Deuteronomy chapter 5, and we shall take this straight through the book of Deuteronomy. I chose this passage because in Deuteronomy 28, it tells us that we were taken away in ships. I want you to see why. So that we don't point the finger at the white man anymore or at any group of people. We need to point that powerful finger at ourselves. It's because we were disobedient, stiff necked unruly people. Now, some of you may think that, oh, well, I, I know these laws. I've read these things before. Well, it's not about reading. It's about studying, brothers and sisters. We're going to go through this together. We're going to take this journey so that we can enlighten ourselves. This word is our power. If you have this word in your heart, you shall become powerful. Have you ever seen a superhero? That's what you will become. If you learn these laws, statutes, judgments, and commandments, and apply them. Let's begin. The law. We need to have a few definitions, right? The system of rules that a particular country or community recognizes as regulating the actions of its members and may enforce by the imposition of penalties. Brothers and sisters, this is not a religion. This is a way of life. Before you can enter into the kingdom, you must learn these laws, statutes, judgments, commandments, apply them to your life. So that once you come into the kingdom, you will know how to conduct yourself. Now, if you keep the law, just like in the United States of America, everything will go well with you. But if you violate the law, brothers and sisters, there's always going to be a penalty. The statues. They say it's archaic but it's in biblical use. A law or decree made by a sovereign or by the mighty one. Basically, it's the mighty one telling you how he wants you to function. Let me give you an example of a statue. And as we go through our lesson plan, we'll point out these different laws, the statues, the commandments, the judgments as we go along so you can get an idea exactly what you're reading. But an example of a statue is this. Love Yahuwah, thy mighty one, with all thy heart, with all thy mind, and with all thy soul. That is a statue. The most important of all. Judgments. The act of judging. The act or process of the mind in comparing its ideas to find their agreement or disagreement, and to ascertain truth, or the process of examining facts and arguments, to ascertain propriety and justice, or the process of examining the relations between one proposition and another. So we all understand the process of judging. You know, when you go to a court of law, you go before the judge and your peers, and they hear your side of the story. They also hear the allegations from the person who is saying that you did something against them. You weigh the evidence to see which side is right or wrong. And then you render a judgment. That's what the judgments in the Bible are for. Like I said before, brothers and sisters, this is not a religion. This is a way of life. If you lower it 
to the level of a religion like men want to do, it shall have no power. But once you accept it exactly for what it is and see that it is laws that the Father has given to us to live by, that it may go well with us, then you will apply these things to your life. Commandments, a command, a mandate, an order or injunction given by authority, charge, precept. This is what we don't like. We don't want anyone, even the mighty one, telling us what to do, do we? We don't want him to dictate the terms, do we? Let me explain to you what obedience is. Whether you like it or not, you still do it. That's what obedience is. Rebellion is when you don't like what you're hearing and you decide to go to the opposite direction. That's rebellion. Rebellion ends in death. When you hear a command from Yahuwah, I don't care whether you like it or not. You have to apply it to your life, brothers and sisters. But one thing about his commandments is that they are not grievous. Do you know that every commandment that he has given, up, given to us is for our benefit? It doesn't hurt us in any single way. Let's begin. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. And Moses called all Israel. Note, who did he call? Who is the target group? Did Moses call the world? Did Moses call all nations? And said unto them, Hear, O Israel. Note, who does he want to hear? Did he say, Hear, O world, hear, all nations? No, the target group is the children of Israel. The statutes and judgments, which I speak in your ears this day, that ye may learn them and keep them and do them. Who are the people that he wants to learn them, keep them, do them? the children of Israel. Did you know that these laws are attached to a promise? If you don't keep them, they are attached to a penalty. Now, everyone wants to gravitate to these laws, statutes, judgments, commandments, because they want the promises. They don't know what they're getting into, do they? Because no one's ever explained to them what these laws is all about. That's what this exercise is for today. I don't think that anyone can do them without the spirit of the mighty one. The spirit was promised to who? The children of Israel. When did it come? At Pentecost. Who are the promises promised to? The children of Israel. No one else. Let me prove it to you. In Romans chapter 9, verse 1 to 5, listen to what Paul had to say. The most misquoted apostle of all time. The one that the church lies on, stating that he said that the law was abolished when he never said any such thing? I tell you the truth. Those who came before us had no reading comprehension, nor did they have the spirit of the mighty one. But listen what Paul is going to say about this. I say the truth in the Messiah. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. Verse 2. That I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Verse 3. For I could wish that myself were accursed from the Messiah for my brethren. 
my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Who does he want to be a curse for? The world? All nations? No. Paul only sent these letters to the children of Israel. He said that he would wish that he could be a curse for them because he saw the low state that they were in. But it's not for the world, it's for his brethren, his kinsmen, according to the flesh. And Paul was an Israelite. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. Now look at verse 4. He's going to point out who he wants to be a curse for. Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of the mighty one and the promises? Who does the promises pertain to? The children of Israel. No one else, brothers and sisters. What a privilege and an honor to be of this bloodline. This is not about a convert or a sojourner. It's about a physical bloodline that comes from our forefather, Jacob, whose name became Yazrael. Verse 5. Whose are the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and of whom, as concerning the flesh, DNA, the Messiah came, who is over all, the Mighty One, blessed forever. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. The Messiah did not come to save the world. The scripture tells you that right here. He's telling you who the Messiah came for. Those who were in the flesh, those who were under the law, those who were the seed that came from Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob, the ones whom the mighty one gave the laws, the statutes, the judgments and commandments, the children of Israel. That's who the Messiah came for. No one else. Everyone else is trying to take hold of this. You cannot. He only came to redeem those who were under the law. The word redeem itself means to purchase back. In order for you to be bought back, you had to first belong to him. Who belonged to the mighty one? Only the children of Israel. Now that we return to Deuteronomy 5, let's proceed at verse 2. Yahuwah, our mighty one, made a covenant with us in Horeb. Verse 3, Yahuwah made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us here alive this day. So who did he make the covenant with? The children of Israel. It tells you right here clearly in verse 3. How many times do you see us? Three times in verse 3. Us is a pronoun. It describes a person, place, or thing. Who is this us pointing towards? Verse 1 tells you it's the children of Israel. Nobody else did he make a covenant with. Verse 4. Yahuwah talked with you face to face in the mount out of the midst of the fire. Did he talk to anyone else from the mount? No one else can make this claim. Verse 5. I stood between Yahuwah and you at that time, this is Moses speaking, to show you the word of Yahuwah. For ye were afraid by reason of fire and went not up into the mountain, saying, verse 6, I am Yahuwah, thy mighty one, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Who did he bring out of Egypt? The children of Israel. Who else did he bring out of Egypt? A whole mixed multitude. There were many other groups of people there, brothers and sisters. Everybody was set free when the children of Israel came. They didn't know how to determine or distinguish between who was who. So they said, all of you get out. But who did Moses call at the beginning of Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 1? the children of Israel. Who did he want to hear this law, statutes, and covenants? The children of Israel. 
who were sprinkled with blood and accepted the covenant with their lips, the children of Israel and nobody else. Verse 7, Thou shalt have none other gods before me. This is a commandment. Don't make any images. Don't bring them in front of his face. He said, don't even speak their names. Then why do you speak their names, Brother David? Because I am the prophet that speaks for the mighty one. I have to tell you the names that you're calling on that you should not be calling on. If you read the prophets in the books, you'll see that they mention Baal, Moloch, Cheon, and quite a few other gods because they wanted to tell the children of Israel who they were serving and to stop it. Verse 8, Thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters beneath the earth. We've been through this one, right? You've seen how the brothers are making images of Yahawashai, how they're making dolls and stating that these are the comforter dolls. The father says, don't do that. You came out of the church with all of those images, the picture of the white Jesus, the picture of all of the angelic beings flying around, that statue of the Virgin Mary with child, the father says, don't you even make it or don't paint any pictures of it. Verse 9, thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. Well, they'll say, we don't bow down to them, but you're serving them. If you're saying that this is the image of your mighty one, your Messiah, his uh, mother, you were serving that image. Burn them, throw them in the fire, brothers and sisters. Don't use them again. For I, Yahuwah, thy mighty one, am a jealous mighty one. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. You have doomed your children to death. They will be under a curse if you are looking at, accepting, having these images in your home. If you are serving them. If you are bowing down to them. Your children will be cursed to the fourth generation. And look at what it says at the end. Anyone who does this behavior hates them. So if you're in, in any of these camps and they have those images, those people do not love the mighty one. They hate him. Verse 10. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Listen to what true love is. A person that keeps his commandments. Whether you like it or not, all you have to do is follow him and do exactly what he says. Verse 11, thou shalt not take the name of Yahuwah thy mighty one in vain, for Yahuwah will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. When I was in the church, we used to think that taking the name of the mighty one in vain was to say things like, you know, when you stub your toe on the wall, you say, oh, Jesus, that's taking his name in vain. That is not true, brothers and sisters. Let me show you what taking his name in vain is. You see the definition on the bottom? Empty. Worthless. Having no substance, value, or importance. That's what taking his name in vain means. How do you hold it empty, worthless, or having no substance? Let's read verse 11 again, the way that it's written. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. If you read it in that fashion, you have violated the commandments. Why do I say that? Because over 7,000 times, 
They took your father's name out of this book. They said it was ineffable. Ineffable means that it's too sacred for you to utter. So they replaced it with Lord and God. Do you know the Lord means Baal and God is an English figurine, you know, from Britain? It's some God that they have in the little statue. They've replaced the name of your father with the name of their gods. And we don't even know because we don't study. So everyone who reads the scripture the way I just read it, using the Lord, God, Jehovah, Jesus, any of those names, you are taking the name of the mighty one in vain. It is empty to you. It is worthless. It has no substance, no value or no importance. But there is only one name under the sun given amongst men that you can be saved by. And that name is Yahuwah. That's where your salvation lies, brothers and sisters. Even your Mashiach, your Messiah, he said, I've come in my father's name. What is the Messiah's name? Yahusha, which means Yahuwah is salvation. So if you do not use the name of your father, especially when you're reading the Bible, you're taking his name in vain. I tell you the truth. All of the Israelites are guilty of all 10 of these commandments. That's how bad it is. That's why the father told me to come and show you and build on his law. I have to elaborate. I have to teach you. I have to define it for you. If you think that you knew it before, you have not heard anything yet. As we go through this, you're going to hear some things that you've never even heard before. But remember this commandment from now on when you read your Bible, replace that Lord and God with his name and his title. As you see in all of my reading, even though I haven't even changed the, the names that they put here because it's going to be so exhaustive after I go through all of these chapters. I still read it the way that it should be read. Verse 12. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as Yahuwah thy mighty one have commanded thee. How do you keep it when you don't even know when it is? We've been told by the Europeans that it's every Saturday or Sunday. We found out that everything that they've said so far or taught us so far is a lie. If you're keeping that Saturday Sabbath, it's obvious you never investigated it. Verse 13, six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. Verse 14, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahuwah, thy mighty one. How do you find the seventh day? How do you identify the six days of labor? Then find that seventh day. Is it by the Gregorian calendar? That's what we've been following. If you have not investigated this, you have dropped the ball because this is important. This Sabbath is four times per month. If you're not keeping it properly, you are violating this rule. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. No one is to work. Even if you have a guest in your home, he has to keep this Sabbath day also, brothers and sisters. Now, I've created a whole series on the Sabbath and how to keep it. You have to prove it to yourself. You have to really study this. 
You cannot just accept what the Europeans have passed down to us through these generations and expect to be saved by what they give you. They don't want you to make it. Once you have turned to the Father's ways, the Gentiles' time is up. Then he returns to get you. Verse 15. And remember that thou was a servant in the land of Egypt. And that Yahuwah thy mighty one brought thee out thence through a mighty hand, and by a stretched out arm. Therefore Yahuwah the mighty one commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. This is a statue, brothers and sisters. This is also a part of the testimony. Because you have to testify that the mighty one brought you up. The commemoration for the seventh day Sabbath here in Deuteronomy chapter 5 is to remember that he brought you out of the house of bondage. That's what Egypt means. This is why we still keep it today, even in this house of bondage. We are preparing for the kingdom. Verse 16, Honor thy father and thy mother, as Yahuwah thy mighty one have commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged, and that it may go well with thee, in the land which Yahuwah thy mighty one giveth thee. Note, do you see all the young men and women that are being shot down in the streets? Have you noticed that? They have violated this commandment. They did not honor, reverence, and obey their father and their mother. Listen, who's first? The father. Why am I so sure? In 2 Timothy, it tells you that children will be disobedient to parents in these last days. The Bible is definitive. We have to know what is going on. We always point the finger. When you see these children on the news, you see them with their uh, graduation uniforms and, you know, pictures of better days. And they tell you, oh, he was a good boy. They don't tell you about the times when that child cursed their parents out and called them every name in the book. They don't tell you that. This is why our children are falling in the streets. Verse 17. Thou shalt not kill. Well, it's obvious that we can kill because the father, when we came into the land, told us to wipe out the indigenous population. We'll get into that later. But this word should be, thou should not commit murder. The Israelites were a closed society. He was speaking about us not murdering each other. It's obvious we did not get the memo. Black and black crime is out of control. That's where our people are dying. If a white man or a police officer kills one of our brothers and sisters, there's major protests. But if we kill one another, nothing happens. Nothing is said. That is the violation of this commandment. Thou shalt not kill. Verse 18, neither shalt thou commit adultery. Now, this is also widespread amongst the Israelites. What am I showing you, brothers and sisters? Our people are violating every single commandment that the Father tells us to keep. Let me take you into another realm. Let's take you to the Messiah. He is going to elaborate on this situation. Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 to 32. Verse 31. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Who's speaking here? The Messiah, the Mashiach, 
Yahusha. Look at the words that are put here, the pronouns, his and him. Who can give a letter of divorcement? Only the husband. In America, they let both parties give a letter of divorcement. But according to the law, that power is only in the hands of the husband. But there's criteria that must be met. Verse 32. But I say unto you, Yahusha, the Mashiach, says unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, cause of her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. This is plain and simple, brothers and sisters. You cannot divorce your wife unless she commits adultery or fornication. You can't get rid of her because she's unruly. You can't get rid of her because her breath stinks. You can't get rid of her just because you don't like her. If you do so and you put her away, and she comes in contact with another man, she has committed adultery. And if she marries this man, she's caused him also to commit adultery. So their marriage will be an adulterous marriage. Are you seeing this? Look how many people sinned. The man sinned by putting her away for any other cause but fornication. The woman sinned because she went and married another. The person that she married sins because he married a woman that still belongs to another man. Do you see this? This is why the Messiah came to elaborate on these commandments. This is why the Father has sent me here to elaborate on these commandments for you. The things that you do not see, I am here to show them to you. Now look at the issue here. It is not the point of just putting her away or divorce. This has to do with divorce and remarriage. If the husband put this way, this wife away and she doesn't marry again, nor seeks another man and stays by herself, then there's no adultery committed. But if she marries is when all of the problem starts. The first husband caused her to commit adultery by putting her away. When she married that other guy, she caused herself and this man to to commit adultery. Are you seeing how the law works, brothers and sisters? The woman does not have the right to make these decisions. If you married a man and he is beating you down and you leave him, you cannot marry another. Now we return back to verse 19. Neither shalt thou steal. Uh-oh. <laughs> we have a twisted view of what theft is, don't we? If you take something without permission, you have stole. Oh, but I just borrowed it, Brother David. I was planning to give it back. No. You have stole that's how this thing works this commandment is clear don't steal verse 20 neither shalt thou bear false witness against thy neighbor do you know what this means no gossip 
just because you hear someone tell you something about a person and you decide to go and regurgitate it, repeat it to another, and it's not true. You don't know if it's true or not because you didn't prove it. You just repeated it. You have borne false witness against your neighbor and you have violated this commandment. I tell you the truth, the Israelites do not know what these 10 commandments are. So far as you've seen, the Israelites have not kept any of them. Remember when we were creating the video series about the Israelite brothers in those camps and how they're calling themselves the Holy Ghost and the Comforter and all of that. And when we got to IUIC, I told you I saw many videos of people who left IUIC that were making railing accusations against them. I told you we would not repeat them because they cannot be proven. There's one word against another man's word that we were only going to stick to the facts. Why did I say that? Because of this commandment. It is the same way that you must carry yourself. Do not repeat what others have said without proof or else you have borne false witness against your neighbor. Verse 21. Neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife. Neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant his ox or his ass or anything that is thy neighbor's. Note, this verse uses a pronoun, his, 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 his. So the neighbor is a man. Everything that falls under the neighbor is listed as a possession. Let's look at the possessions. The wife, the house, the field, the manservant, the maidservant, the ox, the ass. And then the last one is anything that belongs to that neighbor. Ladies, I know something is happening in your stomach. You don't want to be listed as a possession. You want to be listed as equal with him. We'll get into that in a few seconds. But you are his possession. Why did the Father create you? To be a helper for him. After the fall, after the woman ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the Father came down and set, out, set down the penalties, he told the woman that her desire shall be unto her husband, and the husband shall rule over her all the days of her life. Who is able to give a letter of divorce? Can the wife do that? The possession cannot do that. Only the husband. You see how perfectly synchronized the Bible is? The only thing that's out of whack is us. When you know your place, you can become powerful. Now the wife is the greatest possession of all. For the man. She lies with him. Can any of the other possessions say that? She bears his children. Can any of the other possessions say that? She makes him powerful in the gates just by her behavior. Can any of the other possessions say that? She shares in all that he has. Can any of the other possessions say that? She is one with him. Can any of the other possessions say that? If we stick to the ranks that the Father has given us, do you know that we would not have all of the problems that we have today? This is why there's so much trouble. This is why women are out there marrying these men. 
marrying evil men, men who have no relationship to Yahuwah whatsoever, for whatever reason that they married him. And then when the guy goes and he beats the crap out of them to preserve their life, they run away and leave. Whose fault is it? Who chose him? They did. If you are in that circumstance and you've been in one of these marriages, these abusive marriages where this guy is beating the mess out of you or he's speaking about you like you're a dog and you feel that you have to leave, remember something. You cannot marry again until he is dead. Verse 22, these words Yahuwah spake unto all your assembly in the mount out of the midst of the fire, of the cloud, and of the thick darkness, with a great voice. And he added no more, and he wrote them in two tablets of stone and delivered them unto me. He wrote ten commandments with his own finger and gave them to Moses. That's how important this is. The father wrote this with his own finger. If you violate these commandments, you have violated Yahuwah. Verse 23. And it came to pass when ye heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness. For the mountain did burn with fire. That ye came near unto me, even all the heads of your tribes and your elders. Verse 24, And ye said, Behold, Yahuwah our mighty one have showed us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that the mighty one doth talk with man, and he liveth. So not only did Moses witness this, even the heads of the tribes and the elders. Verse 25, now, therefore, why should we die? What are you talking about? Elders and heads of the tribes? You witnessed this. You heard the commandments coming from the mighty one given to Moses. You heard the voice of Yahuwah. You were there. You didn't die then. Why do you believe that you will die now? For this great fire will consume us. The fire didn't consume you before. Why do you believe that it will consume you now? If we hear the voice of Yahuwah, our mighty one, anymore, then we shall die. Verse 26. For who is there of all flesh that have heard the voice of the living mighty one speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and lived. You and Moses, you heard this voice coming out of the fire. You witnessed this and you have lived. What are they doing here? What are they talking about? Why are they making these comments? Verse 27, go thou near and hear all that Yahuwah, our mighty one, shall say. Who are they talking to? They're speaking to Moses. And speak thou unto us as that Yahuwah, our mighty one, shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and do it. They didn't want the mighty one to speak to them. They wanted someone else to receive the word and to spoon feed them. This is where it came in that the law is the law of Moses. It's not the law of Moses. It is the law of Yahuwah. But look at what they said. Once you get this law from the mighty one, we will hear it and we will do it. Verse 28. And Yahuwah heard the voice of your words. When ye spake unto me, and Yahuwah said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said 
all that they have spoken. Verse 29. Oh, that there was such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it may be well with them and with their children forever. This is a prophetic word from Yahuwah. He's telling you that he looked into their hearts and they do not respect him. They don't want to hear the commandments. How were they going to do it? If we hear it from the mighty one, they said, we may die. Isn't this crazy? Let me tell you what's even more crazy. This is the way that the children of Israel carry themselves today. You can read this word for yourself. You can sp pray and speak to Yahuwah yourself and listen for his answer. answer. You can ask for guidance. You can ask for wisdom and he will not withhold it from you. But the same way as the elders and the leaders of the tribes were in this day is the same way that the Israelites are in this day. They want someone to spoon feed them. They don't want to keep the commandments for themselves. They don't want to hear it. If they don't hear it, then they feel that they won't have to do it. But all you have to do is look at our circumstances. We are suffering the penalties this day because of our forefathers. That it made, might be well with them and with their children forever. This is why we are suffering. We don't want to hear it or do it. When you hear the word and you run away, when the word starts, you're supposed to just gravitate towards it. It's supposed to be like a magnet for you. It is for me. And I know it is for a lot of us. But when you hear this word start and you start to run away, when you see a video that's speaking about these commandments and it's 45 or an hour long, you don't want to hear that. That's too much of the father's word. It's going to bring conviction. It may even change your behavior. You don't want to hear it because you don't want to do it. Verse 30. Go say to them, get into your tents. Go hide yourselves. Verse 31. But as for thee, as for you, Moses, Stand thou here by me, and I will speak unto thee all the commandments, and the statutes, and the judgments, which thou shalt teach them, that they may do them in the land which I give them to possess it. You see what I'm saying? The Father wanted all of us to hear. The father wanted all of the leaders to hear, the leaders of the tribes. I want you to understand, powerful men were standing there and they decided to run away because they didn't want to hear anymore. It was too much conviction for them. So they made excuses that, oh, we may get burnt. You didn't get burnt the whole time he was giving Moses the Ten Commandments. We may get consumed by the fire. You didn't get consumed that whole time. You're making excuses. The father knows the heart. You cannot lie to him. He knows your heart, brothers and sisters. You have to hear this and you have to do it. Verse 32. Ye shall observe to do therefore as Yahuwah, your mighty one, have commanded you, ye shall not turn aside to the right or to the left. This is a statue, brothers and sisters. Verse 33. Ye shall walk in all the ways which Yahuwah, your mighty one, have commanded you, that ye may live, and that it may be well with you, 
and that ye may prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. This is a statue. This is what a statue looked like. 32, 33. These are statues, brothers and sisters. What is this doing? This is preparing you for the kingdom. Preparation. This is why my father told me to give you these commandments. So that you can prepare for the kingdom. We're talking soon. There's no date attached. But he's going to come as a thief in the night. Will you be ready? Will you be one of those who will say, I have heard it. And I have done it. Continue to chapter 6. Shalom.